Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Hustle & Glow. I'm Dr. Kim Nichols, board-certified dermatologist and owner of Nichols MD of Greenwich, Skin Lab in Harbor Point, Stanford, and my brand new location, Nichols MD of Fairfield. Thank you for joining us today. As you know, I created Hustle & Glow to educate those in the beauty business on how to attract, maintain, and grow loyal clientele. Each topic is curated by me for you with passion and profitability in mind. We all know that your staff is an essential part of maintaining and growing your business. So I have invited members of the Nichols MD team to share their own pearls from their respective roles in the aesthetic industry. I hope this series gives you not only an insight on different aspects of what makes a business work well, but also provides a glimpse into the hard work, passion, and dedication of my staff. Hello, everyone. It is so great to connect here at Hustle & Glow, where we think about business and how you can really marry both passion and profitability and popularity in mind, especially in the aesthetics business. So my name is Emily Ann Scalise. It is really wonderful to connect with you all here at the Hustle & Glow Nichols MD Institute to talk about a very important topic, which is today's presentation, Real Techniques to Promote Inclusivity and Diversity at Your Practice. And I think there's probably many of you, all of you um, that are joining us today, already agree that we all need to increase our inclusivity and our diversity at our practice. Um, but I think we all would agree we, we want to do better, we want to improve, and we, of course, want inclusive and diverse practices when it comes to our patients, when it comes to our, to our reps, our aesthetic partners, our marketing, we all know that. But what I really love about today's presentation is exactly how you can do so. And this presentation is not meant to set out um, all encompassing techniques and all encompassing ways that you can do so, but they give you real techniques on how to do so and how we do it here at our practice. Um, so without further ado, we're going to get started. And I'm mostly excited to talk to you about this topic because it's an important one, but also because I'm biased. My role as director of Nichols MD, I call it the psychology of business. Um, my, my background's in psychology. I thought I was going to go to med school um, and I was afraid of needles and it didn't, I, it just wasn't for me. But what I did instead is I went and I got my master's in clinical and counseling psychology. And I realized the way that we, we work with people, whether it's patients, whether it's our staff, whether it's our employees, our family family members, community members, it's important. And the way that we make people feel is really important. And so what we've done over the years, thanks to Dr. Nichols, our owner of Nichols MD, which is now three locations, um, what we've really done is that we've really challenged our staff. And the one big takeaway from today's presentation is that we believe that your staff is one of the most valuable assets that you can have in business, and that's in any business. We're specifically talking about the aesthetic business, but really in any business. So we believe your staff needs to be challenged, they need to be empowered, they need to be encouraged. And for us, we believe that our staff is our, co our company's most valuable asset. So um, we celebrate together, we win together, we also get through the hard times together. And actually right here on the left is a real photo of our staff which we're very proud of um, in full, you know, uh, of our full team. This is at our Fairfield location, which opened up in 2022. And if you see, we we are a staff with, um, you know, we're, Dr. Nichols is right in the middle, but, but our staff is bilingual, trilingual, uh, multiple immigration statuses, different types of education, race, um, and we're really proud of that. And so there has to be intentionality when it comes to diversity and inclusion. And so we have a responsibility, we think, to make a difference in our in our employee lives, but of course, in our patient lives inside the exam rooms. So let's talk about that. Many people don't realize the difference between diversity and inclusion and also diversity management. So the first thing that really stood out to me is even when preparing this presentation, I thought, well, what is made up of diversity? What does it include? And I knew it include the the what you would expect, right? So gender, skin color, um, you know, sexual orientation, visible diversity traits. But I actually turned to SHRM, the Society of Human Resources and Management, to say, how do they define it? And of course, this is their official definition, which is the mixture of differences and similarities that includes, for example, individual and organizational characteristics, values, beliefs, experiences, backgrounds, 
preferences, and behaviors. But what I loved was right here. This is a really wonderful visual representation of what is diversity. And it shows that there's visible diversity traits, things that we expect, physical traits, behaviors, age, gender, skin color. There's also physical abilities, but there's also invisible diversity traits, um, work background, education, marital status, beliefs, thinking styles, um, sexual orientation, socioeconomic statuses. And I think the big thing here is that you can't assume and you have to recognize your own biases. And I should take a pause to say that I recognize my own biases, right? I am a woman. Um, I am uh, identify as white. And there are some privileges, but there's also not some privileges there. And I have to make sure that when managing, anyone is managing our team, that we recognize our own biases when it comes down to it. So what is diversity management? It's the comprehensive organizational and managerial process for leveraging diversity and achieving inclusion that maximizes the potential of all employees. So what's the takeaway here? You've got to make sure that your employment practice, but also that your aesthetic practice is maximizing and making others feel comfortable, um, normal, feeling part of, right? And that's inclusion. So I just thought that was important to differentiate the difference of, of course, diversity, diversity and inclusion, which inclusion is granting those access, granting those access to opportunities and resources so that one can fully achieve their own or the organizational success. Okay, so when preparing this presentation, I also think it was, imp I, I thought it was important that we go through the fast facts regarding diversity and inclusion. So first, since 2020, COVID-19 has exasperated the already uneven work equity gaps. Women's jobs are 1.8 times more vulnerable to this crisis than men's jobs. Women make up 39% of the global employment, but only account for 54% of the overall job losses. Corporations identified as more diverse and inclusive are 35% more likely to outperform their competitors. So it literally pays to be more diverse and inclusive. However, 6.6% of all Fortune 500 companies have women as their CEOs. Gender diverse companies are 15% more likely to notice higher financial returns. 74% of millennial employees believe their organization is more innovative when it has a culture of inclusion. And 47% actively look for diversity, diversity and inclusion when sizing up potential employers. So what have we learned so far? Obviously that um, it is important to help with the innovation of your business, but also that new employees are looking for this. They want somebody, they want an employer, they want a company that is privy to um, more inclusive workplace uh, environments. 78% of employees who responded to a Harvard Business Review study said that they work at organizations that lack diversity in leadership positions. And I also, this is an unfortunate fact, but I also think it's important that we look at, you know, when companies boast or share, you know, um, their gender, their their equity gaps or anything like that, that we often also say, but who's who's making the decisions? Who are those that are in power? And I think it's important to, to ask those questions because it's not enough to have a workforce, a diverse workforce. The next step is the most equal step is, of course, having a, a uh, an inclusive and a diverse leadership workforce. Inclusive companies are 1.7 times more likely to be innovative and gain 2.3 times more cash flow per year. I should back up to say, and I'm actually going to go back to a previous slide, the staff. I should back up to say that this is our staff and, and I didn't properly, you know, share what's really important to us. And for us, it's women empowerment is, is very important. We're a staff made up of mothers, single mothers, um, single women, mar married women, uh, career women. And that's something that we're, you're, we're highly biased towards. And that doesn't mean that we're not, uh, we don't think that other visible or invisible diversity traits are as, as important, but it's also important that we, that we realize our own biases and that we hone in on them, but we also hone in on the ones that we, we might not consider as much. And so that's what this presentation is really about today, is, is coming up with real practical ways in which you can improve upon your workplace. 
And even when it comes to not only employees, but also um, uh, aesthetic patients, I, I think this is important that we look at the trends over the years and total patients of color are significantly less, uh, less likely to visit an aesthetic practice. And although it's increased over the years, I think there's many reasons for this. First and foremost, you know, you know, do we have diverse marketing? Secondly, do, um, do our providers, are they well-trained on reviewing multiple patients of visible and invisible, um, you know, diversity, right? And I also think that it's important that we have providers who identify as such. And so I really applaud those that understand that it's a dynamic approach, that it's not enough to just market a specific demographic or market a specific race, but to realize that are we recruiting that race? Are we ensuring that those individuals um, are in leadership positions? Are we ensuring that our providers reflect that? Um, and so over the years, it has obviously doubled in the patients of color, but it is still not equal to what we know of patients that identify as white. Okay, so we know the importance of it. We know, of course, the reasons for it, but how do you do so? And people say this all the time. They're like, "That's a that, those are great facts, but now how do I put it into place? So these are, these are some real examples in which we get to show from Nichols MD, which is exciting. So first, I always like to do a self-test. And I have our marketing pod um, join me in doing this. So what, what do we look at? We look at our total influencers. We look at the last six posts that we've done on our social media. And we say, what are we showing and what are we not? And making sure that we're showing different ages, different diversities, different genders, kind of going back to that great first diversity that Sherm defines in that presentation there. But And you get to say, oh, wow, in the picture to the left, it's great that we're showing different ages. We're also showing different skin types, um, that we're showing different skin concerns, right? It's not just anti-aging. It's also anti-acne. Um, it's also showing pigmentation, right, which is all great things. But what also are we missing? And so in our random six slide, we look here. Here, and you can probably identify, you know, we're, we're looking for diverse gender, right? We're looking for the possibility of showing more anti-aging. Um, and so it's just important that you can't be 100% everywhere, but it is important to know what you have and also what you need to continue to work on so that the next six posts that we have intentionality of what we need and we're set out to do. And then you can also do a self-test. And I say a self-test because I think it's important that you look within and that you have your pods kind of all join you um, in, in ensuring that you have inclusive and diverse photos um, in marketing, right? So when we look at the self-test, you have to make sure that your before and afters, that they show different results because an anti-aging patient in, let's say, his 20s and an anti-aging patient in her 40s are going to look different. And somebody that's a skin type two, somebody who's a skin type four is going to have a different result when it comes to, you know, said chemical peel. And so it's not enough to just have a before and after as part of your, as part of your marketing, as part of your treatment plan, as part of your education to patients. It's ensuring that you have multiple before and afters, showing differences of skin types, even something as simple as, you know, even has how fillers can look quite different in the cheeks um, and the, the, the terms that we might be using. Um, so it's just really important that you, you get to show that the, the diverse results that we see from cosmetic patients and our um, menu of services. And then, you know, again, today's presentation is just how do we really think about and how do we really have practical techniques to ensuring that we do our best when it comes to diversity and inclusion. And something that we started to do is in part of our onboarding uh, program for our new injectors or for our new medical providers, we have a we have a quota checklist. And what does that mean? So let's say that a new um, new injector joins our practice and we want them to be trained on Botox. I'm giving you a hypothetical, but let's say that we say that they are required to perform 20 treatments of Botox um, before they can see a patient. Now that quota is not real, but I'm going to make it up for the purposes of today. So what we say is, yes, you need to have 20 quota models, but of those 20 quota models, five of them have to be over the age of 60, 
Three of them have to be over the age of 40. Five of them have to be gender specific. Um, another five have to be representative of a preventative Botox. Um, you know, two might have to be a model that identifies as white. And so it's, in, it's important that the provider sees how our cosmetic treatments literally differ uniquely and beautifully on all of our different patients and the different of dosage or the terms that people um, might be using or the different motivations that somebody has. And so it's just not enough to say you have a quota model or that you have a quota system. It's, it's making sure that your quotas are very systematic and very intentional for that way so that they get to identify all the different ways in which they could very realistically see patients. And then we've talked about this before, but also do a self-test. Evaluate your executive team and do they portray diversity and inclusion when it comes to race, age, gender, socioeconomic statuses, background, education. Um, of course, we realize that you have your requirements for the role, but ensuring that you have equal opportunity as well as your executive team um, really thinking about and, and representing, right? We, we believe that you should and you have to represent, right? Um, so doing a self-test in that way is, is important. All right, so then next, a technical, um, another real, I guess, practical way that you can ensure that you're having inclusivity and diversity in your practice is staff-wide education. If you're watching this, you might already be privy to this information, but it's important to share it. It's important that everyone is, is thinking about it um, as much as you, if not more, right? So here's what we do in our practice. We're very proud to host, and these are real photos, I should say, um, but these are real photos of our staff at a Grand Browns. Grand Rounds is something we host um, probably quarterly. Um, sometimes the staff wants to do them more, but we host them. And what it is, is what, it's a requirement of all of our staff members of all the locations. We all get together for one hour. The first 30 minutes, well, the first 15 minutes, I should say, um, we're having dinner and we're socializing, we're enjoying. And then we have an hour of grand rounds. And it's led by two people of the staff, one person in the front office, one person in the back office. And we do that because we feel that their front office has to be just as trained as the back office when it comes to didactic learning. What is didactic learning? You know, of course, it's being able to answer questions, to watch things, to look at things. Of course, they're not injecting. Um, we are always within scope, but it is important that they're involved in the education of what they're representing, which is, you know, a cosmetic dermatology office. And so these are real photos of our grand rounds. And what we do is we have a grand rounds template. And in the template, we talk about, you know, of course, what is this treatment? How is it good? Um, how does it benefit our patients? What are patients asking about? Ways that we can incorporate it in the practice? And as you see from the smilings and the smiles and the laughters on their faces, it's usually a really good time because after the 30 minute didactic presentation that's prepared by the front, then the 30 minute um, hands on portion is a live treatment demonstration. And that's what you're, you're seeing here in that middle photo where we actually do the treatment for everybody to learn. But what we're really proud of is that in the didactic for kind of first portion is that we really want to make sure that the, everybody understands the contraindications or even more so the safety of these treatments. Because what we know is, especially in, in medicine, that um, unfortunately research is, is not diverse and it's not well studied of all skin types. And so in our practice, we really go the extra mile in making sure that everyone sees um, the different results and also how skin conditions may look different. Melasma might look different from a skin type one one, two, three, four, five, and six, right? And so our team is very vocal about those differences. We celebrate those differences. And we also educate the team that they are just as well um, trained. Um, so it's a great thing for the staff to get together, to celebrate, but celebrate with intention, celebrate together, and also celebrate, um, you know, the, the beautiful thing, which is that we're all passionate about skin. And then to the right, um, of course, we, we have these grand rounds. We also do education spotlights. Um, we talk about men in the news, kind of what's happening, where we talk about this at our staff meetings. But also something that came up that a staff member brought to us is that there was a wonderful author. And I actually is the, he was a, I think he's a medical student. 
And so he started producing artwork. Medical causes look like in those patients um, of a skin type three, four, and five. He realized an unfortunate trend, which many of the textbooks when describing medical conditions, that they were really only showing the, the, um, the conditions in skin types one, two, and three in the human cartoons or in the cartoon-like images of real medical diagnoses. And so he started to create, and in, in this one is the vitiligo. And I just thought it was um, really, it, it's, it's unfortunate that it took this long to do, but a really wonderful, important thing. And so we've been sharing this even at our staff meetings and also at our medical meetings. So we want to really also make sure that we're always correcting and using the right language. So it seems really silly, and we don't hear this as much, but I have heard it when we're doing tours in plastic surgery offices or other cosmetic dermatology offices. But instead of calling your staff the girls, just switch it. Call them the staff. And really, um, if you don't already have multiple people on your staff that's bilingual, make sure that you do. Um, if you want to see, and you should be seeing more patients, of course, um, that are bilingual, then that's something that should be part of the application requirement, right? And so um, I've, I've even had applicants that just don't put it on their resume. Um, and so asking that even in interviews is really important. If you don't have somebody, of course, that is not bilingual or does not speak the same language, but that you maybe have a system in which they can help you for patient translations. Um, you can use, of course, Google, but I do know that there are plenty of third party sites in which they can, you know, as an answering service or they can help with text um, so that you can make sure that you're speaking uh, with the patient so that they're comfortable and, and really passing on that message. And then language. So it seems very small, but it is so important. And we've done, I mean, these are practical ways in which you can make somebody feel comfortable, right? That you're, you're really celebrating the differences of everybody on your team. But for us, we always make sure that one of the first things we ask for really in the interview is, what would you like to be called? And sometimes you might hear somebody say, well, my name is this, but you can call me this. People usually mess it up so you can call me this. And I say, no, 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 we're going to say it right. So what would you like to be called? And we celebrate that. And we make sure of it. And we might be the first, it's unfortunate, but we might be the first office that ever really called them the their real name because no one's really taking the time to say, no, 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 it's not about me. It's about you. It's your name. And we celebrate it. And so we make sure that the staff obviously uses the right names, um, you know, uses the name that they would like to be called. We also ask them for their nicknames if they prefer that. Um, you know, it's it's just really important that we celebrate that. And the first identity is somebody's name. That's It seems so simple to call out, but I think it's a good kind of trick and tip overall. Um, and then, of course, the spellings. You know, uh, we have people on our staff that even have maybe traditional names, but their spellings are a little bit different. And it's really important that you call that out every single time if somebody else is misspelling it. So it's become a culture here in which we we know how to say last names, even if it's a, in a different language that we, you know, of course, call employees the names that they want to be called, not because it's easier for us, but that we always spell their names correctly. Always, always, always. And um, it's a simple courtesy, but it's the right way to do so. Next is a practical way that we have worked on this in years past is, is, of course, standardizing your hiring questions and your achievements. So as an overall tip, you know, we don't know what we don't know. And we're certainly not here today presenting on these are all the ways in which you could do better. And this, this is why we're so great. Certainly, that's not the case. I think we really want to we really wanted to talk about this in a humble way to say these are the things that we do in our office that you might appreciate. Um, and we invite you actually on our portal and in the comments to share us some of your best techniques and tips on how to improve diversity and inclusion in the workplace. But going back to that, we don't know what we don't know. And so a couple of years ago, we started to work with a, a great Triangle Community Center, a nonprofit here, which celebrates um, the LGBTQ um, community. And so we actually hired them for a small fee, and which they used as a donation. And we had to come in and, and they gave us tips on how we can make the office flow more comfortable and um, you know just more LGBTQ aware. And so something so simple that they taught us 
with a lot of their consultation. They came in, they analyzed their workplace, they analyzed all these things. Something so simple is that um, instead of having gender and then them circling, right? You you have gender and it's an open it's an open space so that somebody can identify in whichever way they'd like. We're not going to give them something for them to to circle. And I thought that was so important. And so just by working with your professionals um, in in any sort of you know regard and inviting them in and inviting that feedback um, can really elevate the space and your environment for both your employees and your patients. Staff engagement. Um, you know, I'm proud to, to be working alongside of our owner, Dr. Kim Nichols, as the director of the Nichols MD practices, but I certainly am not up here thinking that we know it all. You know, I think what we have what we've done really well in the years past is that we've engaged our staff a lot for feedback. Right. And they, you know, it's much better to have um, 25 minds than it is just to have two. And so your staff might, you never know, somebody might have majored in something. Somebody else might have read something, listened to a podcast. And we really respect all roles to submit feedback, especially when it comes to diversity and inclusion. So ask your staff, survey your staff, ask them for feedback ask them for input. You can do this in an anonymous um, survey. You can ask them for their feedback. You can you can simply just say, what are one or two things that we can do to improve upon the diversity inclusion in your department, in your marketing, in your front office? And you never know what you can get up from it. But it's just really important that they know that you want their insight, that we always need to elevate and improve upon this, and that you get them involved. It's certainly not a top-down approach. We all need to make sure that we're part of this very important um, strategy when it comes to, um, you know, of course, our patients and our staff. And then regular readings and input. So we do host office manager meetings, we host marketing meetings, and we even have a section in our marketing meetings that we talk about what are the ways in which we are increasing um, the way, the diverse ways that we're marketing it. And I think it's not something to be skipped over. It's also not something that, you, you know, you should be fearful of. Sometimes it's simply just saying, listen, we're noticing this trend. How can we, how can we improve upon it? Um, and also working with your influence. Influencers, you know, I think that's always great because they're specialists in their specific demographic group. So you can ask them, listen, we want to find ways to improve upon our marketing. Would you give us one or two tips? So just like you survey your staff, you should be surveying your influencers. For staff engagement, you can also, we don't do this in our practice um, because we do um, allow for um we already have PTO, um, which they can do, and we have paid holidays. But I have heard from my colleagues in which they designate paid holidays, but they also give one paid holiday that they float. So if they celebrate a holiday that you don't already have in your standardization, that you allow that employee to choose whichever day off that they'd like. And I think that's really, I think that's really honorable. We give our employees already PTO, and so they can already use it towards their designated paid holidays. But I think it's an important, um, and I really appreciate the pearl for my colleague. Staff engagement, some ways I am a chef at, at home and I love to share my relationships with others by, you know, cooking for them. That's one of my, what do they say, love languages. And it might be for somebody on your staff. And so there's really no better way to really celebrate somebody. Um, I feel this is, of course, a biasy, but then to really allow them to cook for you or to try their foods. Um, and so one way you can engage your staff is having a potluck or even at your staff next night out that you ask your staff, where would you like to go? You know, maybe it's not, maybe it's an Italian restaurant to celebrate an Italian heritage. Maybe it's a Peruvian restaurant. Maybe it's an Ethiopian restaurant, but really changing the different restaurants in which your, your staff enjoys and doing it with intention. Um, you know, for us, we have a couple of employees that are Albanian, and we're looking forward to trying out a new Albanian restaurant in town. Um, and, um, you know, them, you know, of course, leading the way and, and giving us their recommendations. And then lastly, staff engagement um, is just always having a self-reflection of privilege. You know, I think it's, I, you know, we all think it's important. We have to know our biases whether we're proud of it or not, um, whether we know it or not, but also having, you know, maybe a staff retreat to educate those and what is diversity, what is inclusion, what are our privileges and what are or not, you know, what don't we privilege from? And so having that self-reflection always so that your team is always thinking about it as individuals, um, but also so that they, they, re they can bring that into the room for better patient care. 
Um, and then next, another practical way in which you can um, promote inclusivity and diversity in your practice is, of course, using social media as your as your platform to express your thoughts, your opinions. And so I, I'm really proud of um, during the COVID closure, actually, um, we really ramped up our social media. And it was during a time in which um, there were uh, many, many aesthetic companies that weren't actually voicing um, their how they were embracing diversity across their sales and marketing. And so we made a stance. We wrote an open letter to our diversity partner, or I'm sorry, our civic partners. We put on how important it was, but we also, in celebrating how important this was, we also gave them a few endless ways to show our solidarity. And that was recruiting applicants from different technical colleges. Um, and, we, and we wrote them out. Actually, some of them are in, are in this presentation. And I think that one's on the next slide, so I shouldn't have said it. But my point is, is that, um, you know, we we really challenge our aesthetic partners. We have a voice in this community, and it's important that we we do bring it up. So you can always use your social media to share that. And just like the previous post, I did jump ahead, but when it comes to recruitment, make sure that you're reaching out to technical schools, especially those in diverse communities, um, geographically, but also, um, you know, and having strategic internships. So for us, we work with a medical assisting college, we work with community colleges, if something, if some, if a role doesn't require a bachelor's degree, um, you know, we really try to work closely with our community colleges, reaching out to those professors to say, do you have, it's actually a free recruitment way, but, you know, do you have an, a, a student that has really excelled in your program that you think would be great for this role? Um, and working closely with those technical schools or community colleges so that you can have strategic internships um, and really uh, be proud of the, the life opportunities that you get to welcome by working with, with other individuals. And then you can also, in your practice, you, you can create a diversity council to foster the diversity and inclusivity that you want to have in your practice, that we're always thinking about it, that we're using the best terms, that we are really always ensuring that our space um, is fostering an environment of comfortability, but also of equity and fairness. Um, and so you can certainly, you can certainly do so. And then next um, practical way to increase diversity and inclusion in your practice is to diversify your marketing. And honestly, just use your own photos, especially if your team is diverse as it should be. And so these are real photos of our team. I mean, this is all of us um, in the rooms at a staff meeting. You see us in our uniforms, in our business attire. We also, even for cartoon-like images, such as the middle one, this was our ribbon cutting at our second location, which is in Harbor Point, which is where I am now. And so it might not be a real photo, but it's our it's the cartoon art of our real staff. Um, and so we just find that it's important that we dive, we show our own photos for our marketing, but also for our patients. We want our patients to know that we understand their experience, that we literally firsthand and that we do not want to show photos even for unrealistic expectations of eye stock. We want them to know these are real patients or real employees that have, that have experienced, you know, the, the treatments that we're recommending. Um, and I just think it's, it's important that you do so. And then next is, of course, always studying. It's not a one and done. It's not a project list, but it's also something that you're constantly committed to when you think about unique ways to increase diversity and um, inclusivity in your practice. And so something that came up was this was a Harvard Business Review podcast, episode 844. And the title was You're Overlooking a Source of Diversity. And it was age. And I, I just really enjoyed this podcast. I couldn't, I can't recommend it enough. A lot of the things that you actually hear in this presentation are recycled ideas from others. And um, a fact that they had shared in this podcast was 40% of employees are now reporting to a boss who is younger than they are. And they talked about how um, a very realistic conflict had occurred in their in their um, medical office, which was a new manager had come in and, um, and a manager that was, we're, we're going to say a veteran manager had come in and, and there was conflict between the two. The veteran manager had thought, well, you know, you don't know what you're doing. You don't have the experience. And the new manager was up against, you know, that, that type of feeling. And so they realized that you should just lean into that. You should just ask them. And one way that you can do so, so that you can merge the the gap, especially because everybody has the same goal, right? We just do it differently, is, is this. And they shared, 
Um, I'm so excited to have you on our team. I'm looking forward to learning from you because I know you have a lot of experience in this area. I'm going to bring X, Y, and Z to the table. That's what I'm known for. That's what I love to do. But I also value that you bring other things. Um, and even pointing out, I know that you value X, Y, and Z. And in this podcast, they talk about how um, a new nurse was always on her phone when it came to treating patient care. And the veteran staff, mem veteran staff member had had enough and said, I'm so tired of you always being on your phone, all you, I think millennials or whatever the case was. But in short, um, it ended up being that the um, new nurse actually was always on her phone because she was actually trying to find a very efficient way for her patients to find a pharmacy that might be close or closer to the patient. So the end goal was the same, which was, of course, to take care of the patient with the most excellent care, but it looks differently. And so by having, by realizing that everyone has the same goal, but celebrating the generational differences, using something like this can really make a difference. And then, of course, for all businesses, not just for the aesthetic businesses, although Hustle & Glow, we talk about um, business building techniques in the aesthetic industry. It's you should always offer pay transparency amongst similar jobs or similar job titles. So I know for me, I always compare our employees pricing to the, the industries. And so I work with an aesthetic partner who has stats on that. And I'm very honest with the staff. I say, this is, you know, the average, you're either at average or above average in this way, or the entire employee benefit package um, is within average or above average in this way. And I'm every single year, I'm reevaluating our pay, um, our pay structure. And I'm also ensuring that they are fair. Um, and if it doesn't require a bachelor's degree, I'm not going to require one. And that we do value bilingual uh, employees. And so it's just important that we look at um, and we also offer to our employees that we, that they know we're looking at it. And if you're not, um, or if you are, make sure that you're, of course, having transparent conversations about the research that you've done. Other ways for practical techniques um, and tips is, of course, offering staff-wide diversity training and staff engagement for a strong work culture. So our employees, every single year, they attend the Skin of Color Society um, and they go to the AAD. And we really try to strengthen our anti uh, that's strength and we already have them. But I mean, we, we come back trying to figure out um, what are ways in which we can strengthen our medical policies or protocols or education. Um, and, you know, and we and we also ask them to bring back what they've learned um, and how we can possibly even strengthen our own anti-discrimination uh, discriminatory policies um, or how we can strengthen our own medical operations to ensure that our office is, of course, inclusive and diverse. And then finally um, is, you know, wheel techniques to promote diversity and inclusivity of your practice. But I'm really proud of um, Dr. Nichols and uh, Madison Bradley, who's our office manager in Fairfield and myself. We put together this article. It's a two page article, but mainly the things that we talked about today um, and how you can, you know, implement some of these techniques and ideas into your practice. So with that, I just want to thank you all for tuning in. And as a final disclosure, just remember that these are not all encompassing. Um, these are just some of the ways in a quick webinar that you can improve upon your inclusivity and your diversity in your practice. And please um, subscribe to Hustle & Glow, subscribe to Nichols & D YouTube channel, keep in touch with us, and we'd love to know all the ways that you're doing it so we can, we can continue to strengthen our own operations. So thanks so much for tuning in.